Hear our prayers. Amen. Everyone, again, welcome. My name is Lance Marshall. This is The Gathering. I am so glad you're with us today. So uh, one of the things that we do here at The Gathering is uh, break up our times of, of, uh, together in something we'll call series. And series are just chances for me to uh, focus on some topics a little bit more in depth, right? Maybe it's a different approach. Maybe it's a way to think about something. Uh, maybe it's a chance to, uh, uh, to go deeper on a topic. Who knows, right? It's a chance for us to all do these kind of things. And uh, one of the things that we've been reflecting on the last couple uh, weeks is taking this approach, acknowledging the fact that if you, if you come into faith for the first time, right, whether you're a little kid or whether you're a third grader or whether you're a teenager or in your young adulthood uh, or your middle adulthood or your late adulthood, right, whenever you start to engage in faith for the first time, there are a lot of things that can be hurdles to your engagement, right, not knowing the dance steps when you come to a worship service. Right? It's one of the reasons why whenever we have the gathering service, do you notice how we're constantly explaining what we're doing and what we're going to do next, right? trying to help people who are coming in kind of understand what's happening. Uh, it can happen with some of the theology of the church. right? How is it that the crucifixion leads to salvation again? How is it that that leads to the forgiveness of sins? And so we talk about that over and over again. One of the things that we'll talk about uh, and acknowledge is that the Bible itself right, can be difficult to engage with for the very first time. If you haven't received a lot of background information, if you haven't been taught how to use the Bible, right? It can be really unclear. And so the Bible looks like a book. It looks like a book with a beginning and an end. The reality is the Bible is 66 different books. It's like a library. The word Bible uh, is a transliteration of the Greek biblios, which means library. It's a library of 66 different books. Imagine having 66 different books on a shelf. That's what the Bible is. You don't necessarily, when you approach a bookshelf, walk up to it and say, hmm, look at all these books. I will go left to right, (laughs) right? That's typically not how we read our bookshelves. Same thing with the Bible, right? We, we go to the Bible at different times into different places looking for different things. And so one of the things we've been doing uh, over the course of... Um the last month is helping you kind of orient yourself in the Bible, maybe for the first time, or maybe reorienting yourself for the 100th time, helping make sure that when you approach your Bible, uh, you do so with a better understanding of what might be in there for you uh, and places to look when you're looking to encounter certain things. So an exercise that we've been doing uh, over the course of the last month is engaging with the very table of contents in our Bible. If you have a Bible in your lap, if you please turn to the table of contents, uh, every Bible has a table of contents, right? A beginning uh, that shows where all the different books are located. And one of the issues we have with the table of contents is it'll tell you all the different pages where things start, right? But it doesn't always help you find what you're looking for. And so one of the things that we've been doing over the course of the last month is making notes in our table of contents. If you've got one of the Red Pew Bibles, you are more than welcome to write in the table of contents of the Pew Bible because it is going to be a help to whoever uses it after you. Uh, so feel free to do so. So in week one, we talked about how sometimes we're in situations where you just need words for how to pray to God when everything seems to be falling apart, right? I pointed you to Psalm 86, verses 1 through 7. Psalms are prayers. Psalms are poems. Psalms are lyrics to songs that we don't have the music for anymore, but we have the lyric sheets. And so Psalms are incredibly formative in giving us the language for how to speak to God. Right? And sometimes we're in situations where we have this deep angst and this turmoil and this time of unknowing. We want so desperately to articulate what we're feeling to God, to open ourselves up to God. Uh, but some of us aren't super great at expressing uh, what we are feeling, and so the words just fail us. Right? When I, uh, I, I do a lot of uh, premarital counseling. When, before I marry folks, you meet with them a couple times. And uh, one of the questions that I used to ask every time when they were sitting there is, uh, is tell, me, tell me what it is that you love about this other person, right? Just tell me what it is that you love about them that just sets your heart on fire, the reason you want to marry them. I remember the first time I did this, it was a young couple, mid-20s, and uh, the, the female fiancé, the to-be wife, the girlfriend, uh, said this beautiful answer. I don't, I don't remember it, but it was something about he's caring, and he's sweet, and he's loving, and he brings out the best in me, and he encourages me, uh, and blah, 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 blah. And I don't want to, I don't want to traffic in stereotypes here, but so then I asked the guy, would you here spontaneously in front of a stranger tap into your deepest emotions and express what it is you love about this woman? And his answer was, in about five minutes, rambling and stuttering over himself, what he basically said was, she's a really hard worker. <laughs> uh, and then so I, I was like, okay, I probably shouldn't uh, do that. I mean, that didn't work out so good. And so I told that story to another couple. 
and, uh, and, uh, and then asked him the same question, and then she did a really good answer, and he said, well, my fiance is a really hard worker too. And I was like, no more of this. <laughs> Not doing this anymore. So now I give them an email, and I give them a couple days to work on it, all right? And that's a lot better. But that just really haunts us. Some of us aren't really good at articulating and expressing, you know, these really deep feelings, you know, easily, right? And so Psalms are incredibly helpful, giving us that language to talk to God. Uh, over and over and over again, we're in situations where we just need words of direction and encouragement, particularly when things are difficult or just kind of fuzzy, right? It's hard to know which direction to go. Uh, there's an amazing piece of advice from an early church leader, the Apostle Paul, to the church in Philippi, uh, in Philippians 4, 4 through 9, that gives incredible words of wisdom and guidance that are applicable to our lives today. So we added that to the table of contents. Um, over and over and over again, what I keep trying to remind myself and everybody else is at the end of the day, this whole Christian journey is about a deep relationship with Jesus Christ. And, there are, and he's not speaking in all these different portions of the Bible. There's only a few portions of the Bible which are directly Jesus speaking to us, right? And I think that that is the portion we need to be the most invested in, the most heavily reading, the most reflecting on. And if whenever anyone comes in for the first time and they start asking questions like, I want to read the Bible, where should I go? I always point them first to the Gospel of Matthew, which is the first First gospel in the New Testament in chapters 5, 6, and 7. That's Jesus' longest unbroken time of teaching. And so uh, we call that Jesus' best sermon, right? Because it's his most direct, most applicable, most relevant words you're going to get straight from Jesus to you, right? So this needs to be something uh, that we're ready for. Jesus' best sermon uh, is something we need on our table of contents, right? Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And then additionally, we talked last week about the reality that people are always looking for ancient wisdom, right? People are always looking for guidance that has stood the test of time, right? If you give someone a piece of advice, they'll say, okay. But if you say, I got this piece of advice from my father or my mother, they'll go, okay. But if you say, there's a piece of advice that's been passed down through my family from my great, 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 great grandmama, right? The longer and the richer a piece of advice or a piece of direction has stood the test of time, the more valuable it becomes, the more resonant it becomes, the more powerful it becomes. And do you realize that the world's most ancient repository for wisdom regarding not only happiness, but even wealth and the life well lived resides in your Bible in the book of Proverbs, 19 chapters, 10 through 29. It sounds like a long time. It's only about 10 pages. Uh, includes this ancient wisdom for a life well lived, right? Did you know it's in there? When you're just looking for something to reflect on and to give you guidance, it is in your Bible. And so we're adding all that to our table of contents. And before we go in today's message, I want to reflect on kind of why we're doing all this, right? What's my motivating, what's my motivating factor for all this? I don't say enough uh, what I want for you, right? I don't say enough what I want for you. I mean, if you realize every week you, when you come and listen, what you're hearing is, uh, is me telling the story of faith. What you're hearing is me uh, diving into our scriptures and trying to bring back a word that's applicable to you for your everyday life. What I'm doing is trying to share the experiences of my own life and the lives of the people I know and the lives of our community for your benefit and enrichment. What I am hoping for deeply for you is that you and your reflection and your listening and your learning come to have a life well lived. Right? What I deeply want for you is a life well lived. And I firmly believe there is no better way to live a life well lived than as a disciple of Jesus Christ. And when I say a life well lived, I want to talk to you about a life that is good and rich and full of love and joy. Right? And just know that what I wish for you is a great amount of personal professional success. Right? I wish for each and every one of you a life that is full of a great amount of personal, professional success, but I want you to have a life that is rich and good and full of joy and happiness, even if that doesn't work out the way that you hoped it would. Right? And I want you to have a life of rich relationships right, that are strong and good and loving and beneficial, but what you can have is a life that is full of richness and happiness and joy and love, even if those things don't work out the way that you hoped they would, right? And I want you to have uh, a life that is full, that is full, that is full, that is full of health, right, and well-being and a body that functions and ambulates and is free of disease and ailment and injury for a long, 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 long time. But I want you to have even more so a life that is full of richness and happiness and joy and love, even if that doesn't work out in the way that you thought it would, right? And most importantly, I want you to have 
a life that is full of richness and happiness and joy and love that you know, that you know, that you know in your heart of hearts is not limited or ended or stopped by the grave. That's what we're talking about today. This everything we're talking about every single week, right, is connecting you to the source of life itself, is giving you the guidance of God revealed to us, right, is connecting you to the salvation and the life eternal offered by, Je- by God's only son, Jesus the Christ. And one of the things that I need you to know is one of Jesus's greatest works, greatest proclamation, greatest revelation, right, greatest assurance to us is that all of this, all the promises, right, and all the assurance and all of the direction and all of the, the indication of who he is and what he's about is not limited by our earthly death, right? And when we come to read that and understand it and listen to it and believe it, it really starts to change our outlook on everything. So what, what, the last bit that I want us to do uh, on your table of contents before you turn away is I want you to write down promises of heaven. And we're writing down two things. One's the gospel of John. 14, 1 through 4. And the second text is Revelation 7, 9 through 17. And I got to admit, one of the things that I'm bad about as a pastor, uh, as a preacher, as a teacher, is I don't talk about heaven enough. Right? I don't talk about the afterlife enough. One of the reasons I don't is because when I read the Gospels, uh, when I read Jesus' accounts, when, I, when I'm a part of my church, one of the things that I see over and over again is that Jesus' message, when Jesus uh, is incarnate, when Jesus begins his preaching message, his message is not, hey, say you believe in me so that you can go to heaven, right? And then just wait out the rest of your days. Right? Jesus' message is the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your hearts and lives and believe in this good news. Right? So he's talking about the restoration of all things that God is doing in this place too, in this time too, in his midst now, right? both then and now for you. So it has a huge amount to do with how you live your life today, how you understand yourself today, how you treat others today, how you orient your own spiritual being today. Right? It has a huge amount of rootedness in today, and yet one of the things that is fundamentally true is that Jesus promised promises us, right, both in his words and then through the crucifixion, the resurrection, and the ascension, that the grave does not limit the work that I am up to here, right? So there's two things I want you to have uh, written there in your table of contents. The first is John 14, 1 through 4. If you turn with me to that, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are the four gospel accounts that we have. And in this gospel of John, Jesus is preaching and he's teaching. This is this long teaching before uh, the Last Supper, before the crucifixion, right? Before he's facing uh, all that he has to endure, knowing what these disciples are going to encounter, knowing what they're going to see in the next 24 hours, knowing the fear and the pain of the next 72 hours, knowing all the uncertainty in the next 2,000 years, right? Jesus is speaking directly to them and to us, and he needs you to understand that this revolution, right, that he's beginning, this incredible work that he's undertaking, this revelation of God's will that he's providing is not going to stop when I die or when you do either. He says this to us in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. Don't be troubled, he says to all of them and to us. Don't be troubled. Do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. My Father's house has room to spare. If that weren't the case, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When I go to prepare a place for you, I will return and take you to be with me, so that where I am, you will be too. And you know the way to the place I'm going. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. Don't be troubled. Don't be troubled. Right In the midst of all this, in the midst of all the difficulty, in the midst of you seeing what's going to happen to me at the hands of this oppressing power, right? in the midst of seeing my broken body, in the midst of seeing me rolled into a tomb, do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in God. Trust also in me. In the midst of you and your life, your difficulties with kids, right? your difficulties with relationships, your difficulties in your community, your difficulties at work, right? difficulties with your aging parents, in the face of illness, in the face of death, in the face of disease, in the face of unknowing, do not be troubled. Trust in God. Trust in me also, Jesus says. I am going to the Father's house, and I am making a place for you. I would not tell you if that was not true. Our second piece of scripture 
Uh, it's coming from the uh, Revelation. Revelation is the last book in your Bible. Uh, it is, we're going to be in Revelation chapter 7. Uh, it's re- pet peeve. It's Revelation, not Revelations. That's it. That's the end of pet peeve. <laughs> Revelation. Revelation. If you're watching, if you accidentally find yourself on channel two and someone says, Revelations, turn the channel. Um, it's Revelation. Revelation. Sorry. So the book of Revelation is, uh, it's a lot of things. We talked for seven weeks about the book of Revelation, Revelation at the beginning of last y- uh, year. It's so many different things. It's, uh, it's prophecy, right? It's a word to God's people, how to live, how to be. It is a letter, right? It's, a, it's John of Patmos writing to a number of different churches, giving them direction. Uh, it's also an apocalypse, this genre of writing. Apocalypse means revealing, right? Revelation means all about revealing. It means all about showing you something. Revelation means all about giving you an indication of what's really going on behind the scenes, right? It includes a lot of visual metaphor that we're not meant to take literally, but that's meant to be instructive. However, one of the portions of Revelation that has been received by the Christian community uh, as incredibly authoritative and, and much less metaphor and much less direct imagery is the portion that we're going to read today, Revelation 7, verses 9 through 17. This is an image of heaven itself, right? Uh, John of Patmos has been given an image by Jesus, the resurrected Christ, right, to teach and to edify so that he can use to, to help people understand what's really going on, right, in the world, what's really going on in heaven, what's really going on in the kingdom of God, right? One of the most fundamental images we have is uh, Revelation 7, 9 through 17. And so one of the things that I want you to be thinking about is the promises of heaven, the promises of life eternal that we get from Jesus. And one of the core bits we get is this right here. After this I looked, John is saying, and there was a great crowd that no one could number, this endless multitude. They were from every nation, tribe, people, and language. They were standing before the throne and before the Lamb. Uh, The Lamb is imagery for Jesus in this moment. It's a sacrificial image. Uh, They wore white robes and held palm branches in their hands. They cried out with a loud voice, Victory belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood in a circle around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be to our God forever and always. Amen. Then one of the elders said to me, Who are these people wearing white robes and where did they come from? I said to him, Sir, you know. Then he said to me, These people have come out of a great hardship. They have washed their robes and made them white in the Lamb's blood. This is the reason they are before God's throne. They worship him day and night in his temple, and the one seated on the throne will shelter them. They won't hunger or thirst anymore. No sun or scorching heat will beat down on them, because the Lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them to the springs of life-giving water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God speaks to us through the reading of scripture. We have these images, right? We have these promises of Jesus, right? The promise, this is not end with the grave, right? Where I am going, you're going too. I'm preparing a place for you, right? Your life is going to be lived with joy. Your life is going to be lived uh, with difficulty. Your life is going to be lived in all these different ways. And at its end, where I am going, you will be there too. So where do we go from there? Uh, There's two things I want you to do. Uh, both today and more regularly, I want you to think about two things. I want you to think about death, and I want you to think about life. So I had a, uh, I had a, uh, I'm in a small group. I'm in a pastor's small group um, where, you know, we're just each other's buddies and our spiritual friends, and uh, we pray together, and we speak together, and we kind of walk through life together. And uh, I was meeting with my pastor's, my group, my, my, my personal small group earlier this week. We're just making small talk. And uh, I asked one of my buddies, um, you know, how are things going? Anything, you find anything interesting, you know, going on in your life? And he's like, oh, I found this, uh, this new app I really like. And I said, okay, what is it? And he says, it's called We Croak. And I said, okay, what's We Croak do? And he says, well, you sign up for it, and then it texts you randomly five times a day. And what it says is, remember, you're going to die. <laughs> and I love it. <laughs> And we were like, are you okay, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> Everything going okay? <laughs> and he went on, right? And, uh, and, and, he's, and of course, he couldn't just like say, like, yeah, like, he had to like start preaching, and it got boring, and I stopped paying attention. But I'm joking, Jason, he listens. Um, so 
what he's saying, right, what he was saying is something that I've said over and over and over again here in the gathering, right, is that one of the things that you need to realize, one of the things you need to think about now, one of the things that you need to think about today is that we have this image, right, that each and every one of our lives is going to end at age 95, right, after we've had an approximately 40-year retirement, and uh, there just kept being more money, not less, uh, and I kept feeling better and healthier, not worse, uh, and then after an extremely short illness, say about like four to five hours, um, <laughs> you'll pass away in, uh, in a hospital bed holding the hands of all your friends and family singing, Be Thou My Vision, <laughs> right, and that if it doesn't happen that way, it was a ripoff, right, if it doesn't happen that way, it was an unspeakable tragedy, if it doesn't happen that way, uh, it was brutal and unfair, and life wasn't fair to you. One of the things we need to recognize, right, is that our time comes to an end. Your mama's time comes to an end, right? Your children's time comes to an end. All of our time comes to an end, right? And it's important in the midst of our health, and it's important in the midst of our wealth and well-being, and it's important in the midst of healthy relationships to remember that all of this does come to an end so that we love it and that we cherish it and that we appreciate it and that we value it and that we make the most of it. And it's important for us to remember that it comes to an end so we've processed it. And when that time does come, we remember that this is not just the end of this time. This is the beginning of what is next, right? And every person who passes that moment and comes back to us says, I can't explain it, but what I can tell you is there is light and love and the people are there. That is what they all tell us. And we need to think about that now, not only for the good of our lives, but in preparation for that moment. And the next thing we need to think about is life. What does the image of heaven tell us about our life? When we see this image in Revelation, the thing that always strikes me is the people. The people, the innumerable quantity of people that are there. And I hate to say this, if this is the first time you ever heard this, I don't want to burst your bubble, but I need, to pro- I need you to understand, you do not get your own cloud <laughs> in heaven. You do not get your own cloud, right? If that sounds like bad news to you now, you need to work on it, (laughs) right? The image of God's creation is the multitudes together rooted in worship, right? And I need you to think about if that's the image of where this is all going, if that's the image of what we are made for, if that's the fulfillment of good news, if that's the direction that everything is headed, is that where my life is pointed right now? Is my life pointed to community? Is my life pointed to connection? Is my life pointed to sharing? Is my life pointed now, today, to anything that looks like that? Is it rooted to knowing others, loving others, connecting with others? others and worship being the very foundation and ground of your being? Or does it look much, much different? Because the good news is while we wait for that, we can make our lives today much more like heaven if we try. The image of where this is going and where this is headed and where we end up when we root our being in worship and praise and love of God is in connection and in community and in knowing and being known and all of that rooted in the very presence and love of God. That is the promise that awaits you. And it is good, good, good news. May that give you strength today. May that give you encouragement today. May that give you some hope today. And most importantly, may it give you some direction today. Tear down some walls, right? Build some new relationships. Reach out to new people and take the next step into grounding your life in worship with God, because I promise you that is what heaven looks like for you. Please pray with me. Great and loving God, when we read through our text, when we read through these words, we see so much. We see things that challenge us, We see things that cause us to struggle. We see things uh, that make us wonder if we're doing good enough, that we're trying hard enough, that we're being faithful enough. And when we hear today, God, in the midst of all that unknowing, in the midst of all that wonder, Jesus speaking, saying, where I'm going, I'm making a space for you. 
and where I go, you will be there too. And God, when we see this image, this glimpse, when we see this portion of what that life eternal looks like, God, may that be good news to each and every one of us. An image of life spent connecting with others and life spent fulfilling who you made us to be and life spent surrounded by those who are different than us, who speak different than us, who have different backgrounds than us, and each and every bit of our being rooted together in our love and worship for you. God, we come this day asking to be washed, asking to be cleaned, asking to be forgiven, asking to be accepted, and asking to live into the image of heaven, not only at the end of our days, but right now, too. And it's in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, that we pray all these things, saying the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.